and in your latest book, you have a list of your 16 all-time favorite films. Titanic ends that list. Talk about yes. Titanic. Titanic a bit. is is one of my favorite films. I think it's James Cameron's best film. There's a kitschy element to it, and Cameron, uh, there is a kitschy element to all of his work. I mean, it's it's he lacks that classical touch, but. Uh, that's, that aside, the thing that works for me in Titanic is this idea of the end of the world. Uh, it's a sort of um, updating, and, and all of Cameron's films are an updating. He's like a, a sort of Hebrew um, uh, a prophet um, that has that apocalyptic vision of the end of civilization. And he knows that there is a problem with the machine. He's very good with machines consciously, but as his unconscious knows, there's a problem with it. So you always find in his films this idea that machines are taking over, machines are trying to eliminate human beings, and that the experiment of civilization reaches a limit point where once it's, the edifice is created and, and set sailing, uh, there comes a point where the machine becomes too mighty to master and uh, there's a turn, a snap, and a catastrophic bifurcation occurs, just like in chaos theory, and the thing goes down. And to me, I see that as an allegory of our civilization. I see that the sinking of the Titanic is an allegory for our creation of this wonderful, beautiful machine that we have set sail, uh, but it's too big to really manage, and at some point it's, it's going to sink, and it probably is in process of doing so right now. And that film is a wonderful uh, plus, you have the love-death uh, motif with the Tristan and Isolde uh, uh, mythology um, and uh, the two who become one in the end. And there's a lot of wonderful uh, myth-making there. Mm -hmm. What's the effect on our culture of these iconic myth-based films? We go and watch them, and how does that affect us and culture in general? I think the effect is somewhat analogous to what happens when you go to sleep at night and you dream. I think you could ask the same question. Why is it that we go to sleep and we have these dreams? What good are they doing us? And we tend in this society to take a negative attitude to dreams that they, they, they're not a good source of information. There's nothing, they're just these, you know, it's flotsam and jetsam from the day's events. And, but that's not really what's happening at all. The, the, the dreams are the personal myths. And likewise, these films are our collective dreams. They're telling us what is wrong in our society. They're telling us uh, where the problem areas lie. And what they're really saying is that we're having, uh, you know, we're having nightmares about our machines. Consciously, we're, we're building this civilization. We've spent uh, a thousand years at least invested into creating this mechanical edifice, but now we're, instead of it being uh, just you know, something like a grail to be ob obtained, it's now been obtained and we're having nightmares about it. So it's, it's turning into a negative presence, which is why you have these films of homicidal machines, like in the Terminator, for example, or in the new Star Wars prequel, these machines that are just you know, depicted as robots out to eliminate the human species. I mean, it's telling us that the machine that we've created um, has its own life, and it's very dangerous. It can take control of us. It can eliminate our culture, and it can render life, it can dehumanize life. It can rob us of spiritual potential. And I think that's what's going on in a lot of these films. They're, they're telling us that there are machines uh, present a real danger of stripping us of our human uh, possibilities. Mm -hmm. If you start, you know, um, uh, behaving like a machine, then, then you start losing uh, what it means to be really human. Uh, you know, we're not machines. Machines are just tools. They're extensions of us, as Marshall McLuhan used to say. But um, there's something that has to be kept in check, um, because if they start dictating their purposes to us, then you're in trouble and you become just a servo mechanism of the machine. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you're a fan of Spielberg. And, uh, of course, I said that sort of Germanly Spielberg. It's just Spielberg. But anyway, uh, Schindler's List is on your list of, yeah. of the top 16. Now, I saw that. I mean, I thought it was an incredible film. I thought, I think it was ABC Network showed it in its entirety, uncut and uninterrupted. I thought it showed a lot of um, chutzpah, basically. But I thought it was just a, an historical recounting. You see it as an iconic myth-stating film. It is. And um, the myth there is um, the, the Schindler's List is an example of uh, a film that is a realistic, uh, ostensibly realistic narrative all the way through, but yet it tells a mythological story. And the psyche thinks mythologically. Anytime you tell a story, even if you're telling a joke or you start recounting something, the mind automatically transforms the events in terms of these mythic structures. So you can't help spitting out, uh, you know, myth is the grammar of the psyche. And when, you know, when we tell stories, we, we speak in this language. So even if you're telling a realistic story of a factual event, it's always poured through the mold of a mythological narrative. And in the case of Schindler's List, Schindler is an updating of the, uh, the Noah figure. The novel was originally called Schindler's Ark. Um, you know, or a Moses figure is probably a better analogy who leads the people to their promised land. He is the means whereby uh, a group of people gets from uh, one geographical point to another and then uh, he drops out and he becomes this mythic figure in their memory. Uh, Mad Max and the Road Warrior is another example of that type of uh, individual, um, particularly in the 
the sequel to Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, where he delivers this group of people to their destiny, then he disappears and they're just utterly haunted by the fact that this individual sacrificed himself uh, for no other reason than just to do that, to, out of love and compassion, to, mm. to bring these people. Can you name one more film and cover it in just a minute and then we have to close? Uh, well, there is um, an obvious example is the Star Wars films, and I've listed that as one of the, the, the best uh, responses to the problem of the machine because it says that our, even though we're in danger of living a life where machines can attack us, there is also the possibility of finding a spiritual salvation uh, through grounding of the psyche in a spiritual tradition. There has to be some kind of contact with the spiritual dimension, and in doing that, it will make the soul strong enough to stand up to the machine. And then you can live a human life in any, any environment whatsoever. You don't have to get rid of the machines, as Tolkien says you know, in his Lord of the Rings. It's a sort of apocalypse of getting rid of all the machines. And uh, Lucas seems to recognize that they don't have to be gotten rid of. It's the human life that has to be found within the, the matrix. Hmm. So in one minute, John David Ebert, can you summarize the central theme of your latest book, Celluloid Heroes and Mechanical Dragons? Yeah, the central theme is that um, um, mythology responds to changes in the environment. And the changes that are made in the environment are done by new technologies. Every new technology brings about a gradual restructuring, a new environment. And the myths, whether they're stories, fables, romances that come up, are the response on the part of the psyche to meet the outer conditions of the changing environment. And what I found in these films is that the machine is now the problem. It's the main one. And that that is what is troubling our Western psyche. And it's trying to find a way to live a human life within this mechanical environment. Hmm. Well, John David Ebert, uh, again, you're the author of your latest book, Cellular Heroes and Mechanical Dragons, that came out in 2005. And then your earlier book came out in 1999, which was T Twilight of the Clockwork God. You're a former editor at the Joseph Campbell Foundation. And you have an excellent, very interesting website, www.cinemadiscourse.com. And I want to thank you very much for appearing today on Crescendo. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Good. And to you, our viewers, I'm Josh Wagner. Thank you for being with us, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>